uh, over four decades. <laughs> so I think he knows a little bit about um, the foundation and, of course, now. Right, so right. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Max McGraw was born in 1883 in Clear Lake, Iowa, and spent his boyhood in Sioux City, Iowa. But before I get into his uh, very interesting life, I, I wanted to show you these six drawings that were made that, that pretty much tells you what kind of a man Max McGraw was from boyhood on up. His early days, he was an equestrian newsboy. He grew into a public utilitarian. He owned many different natural uh, gas and electric and telephone companies. He was a manufacturer, uh, especially noted for the toaster, which I'll get into later. He was an executive uh, operating many different uh, businesses and companies. He was an avid fisherman, enjoyed the sport of hunting, and was an ardent conservationist. Okay, the early days of Max, if I could uh, read a little bit, if I may. Um, this was Max's teenage years. Every morning at 3.30 a.m., 11-year-old Max McGraw was out of bed. He saddled up his horse and traveled seven and a half miles delivering newspapers in and around Sioux City, Iowa. After school, he would saddle up the horse again and deliver the evening newspapers. This was his routine through his late teens. This routine would eventually develop into multi-million dollar businesses. His boyhood interest was electricity. He spent his spare time taking apart motors and telephones to see how they would, how they operate. Uh, at age 16, he enrolled in an electrical engineer correspondence course. And the information uh, and, and the paperwork and the books he received from this correspondence course he carried with him through his early days of, of uh, his business work. In, in 1900, at the age of 17, he took $500 that he saved from his paper route and began the McGraw Electric Company. His slogan, the McGraw Law is Quality. Early on, the McGraw Company was devoted to converting uh, gas lighting to electrical lighting. He wired this house in Sioux City, Iowa. It was the very first permit that was uh, given out in Sioux City, Iowa. His first year was, as I said, mainly devoted to wiring houses. At the end of the first year, he had lost $39. However, during his second year, things changed around big time. This is a picture of the PV Opera House downtown Sioux City, Iowa. And he received a $10,000 contract to wire this building and put lights in. And before long, he received a $12,000 contract to electrify and, and, and uh, put lighting in the Sioux City stockyards. Several years later, the stockyards expanded, and who'd they call? They called Max back to do further electrical work. This was a picture uh, of a, a drugstore downtown Sioux City, Iowa, and uh, his first office was in the basement of this drugstore. Over the next few years, his electrical contracting business continued to grow. And soon, the McGraw Company was installing telephone systems for entire towns. He then got into the telephone and electrical supply business. This is a picture of his first electrical supply store. By the age of 28, he was running three different businesses. In 1912, Max made a bold move. 
buying a diversified supply company, which was much larger than all three of his companies. At the age of 31, Max had built a paper route into a $2 million business. He owned telephone systems and electrical companies in 12 different states. The toaster, this is a, a very interesting uh, development in uh, Max McGraw's life. Um, in 1926, he sold part of, part of his business to Westinghouse and moved to Chicago. He wanted to be where, where the action was. Um, after, shortly after moving to Chicago, he had heard about this, the, this company that was trying to develop the pop-up toaster. They had a crude pop-up toaster, which was sold only for institutional purposes. But Max thought, boy, if they could have a pop-up toaster at a price that's affordable, the general public would just beat a path to his front door. Max, uh, Max went ahead and bought this company. Um, it was a small company, and, and creating and manufacturing these toasters was very labor intensive for, the, for this company. Um, in the manufacturing world at that time, many different large corporations, such as Westinghouse, had looked at, at the, the pop-up toaster, and they thought that it couldn't be manufactured at a reasonable price, and they passed on it. Max McGraw, however, felt differently. He thought that he could make this work. Um, he purchased the company, and he and his engineers went to work to develop a pop-up toaster that could be mass-produced at a reasonable cost and sold to the public. And in 1929, Max's uh, pop-up toasters hit the market. And boy, was he right. They beat a path to his door. Um, this, as you uh, can probably figure out, is the Toastmaster Company, which was one of Max's companies. Uh, in fact, it was so popular that at one of his stockholder meetings in the 40s, he was getting complaints from some of his stockholders because they couldn't purchase a pop-up toaster. They were in so much demand that they, they could not find a pop-up toaster. So, uh, and other companies that are uh, recognizable even today that, that were Max's companies was Bus Fuse, um, Speed Queen. He got, he got into a lot of the appliance, electrical appliances for households. Now, <coughs> McGraw Electric, as I just said, had many uh, brand names. But, but Max was not convinced that his electric company, the McGraw Electric Company, had a brand name that people recognized and could relate to. Uh, pic he's pictured here with Charles Edison, the son of Thomas Edison. And after a lot of discussion, Max McGraw and Thomas Edison Incorporated merged and it was called the McGraw Edison Electric Company. Now Max had a brand name that he thought people would recognize uh, with, with Edison uh, linked to his name. The arrow's pointing to some kind of early, uh, I, I'm guessing, some kind of light, light, early electric lighting. Yeah, I think you can see uh, right here, it's kind of a bulb right here. And it, it's glowing in the middle there. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I'm sure with the Thomas Edison Company, it probably had to do with lighting, electrical lighting, I, would be my guess, you know. Uh, his, uh, so this merger took place in 1957, and uh, you know, with that name recognition, the McGraw Edison Electric Company uh, became well known and and was a very successful company for many years to come, manufacturing electrical transformers, switches, fuses, anything to do in the electrical uh, world. Uh, McGraw was involved with. Now, if I if I may, I want to go back to the 1930s. Max had just moved to Chicago, and living in the city, he wanted some wide open space. So he came out here to the Fox River Valley and, and began purchasing, purchasing some property where he could hunt, 
fish, practice his conservation. He wanted to develop this property into a haven for wildlife and, 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 and fisheries. This is the very first parcel that, that Max purchased. It is uh, right inside our main entrance, if you know where the Wildlife Foundation is now. And in the lower right, there was a huge spring, which still exists today, and that spring produces four or 500 gallons per minute. It is pure spring water. Uh, he developed the spring to create a trout stream. Trout stream meanders through the property for about a mile or about a half a mile. Um, you notice all the trees. At the time he purchased this property, as I understand it, a lot of the, a lot of the property up and down what is now 25 was pasture land. There was a lot of dairy business in the area. So, uh, with the help of his good friend Art Hill, who owned D Hill Nursery at Route 72 and 31, uh, he purchased. In 1938 and 39, he purchased over 750,000 trees to plant on his property. He had, he had amassed about 1,600 acres, some right along the Fox River, and then this is what we call our central unit between Duncan Avenue and Route 25, and then we own flat agricultural land east of Route 25. And Max had a vision. He, uh, uh, along with planting wildlife habitat, he, he dug. Uh, about 30 some bodies of water, which would eventually become uh, very fine fishing lakes. Here's a different view uh, looking across the trout stream. Uh, this is back in the 1930s. If you see in the upper left hand corner, that was the beginning of uh, our main lodge that we, that we call today our pond cottage. Uh, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, Max uh, used the property to some degree as a sportsman's club where he and his friends and business acquaintances could come out from the city and, you know, do what they wanted to do, hunt fish, plant trees, and, and what have you. So early on, it was called the Fin and Feather Club. Today, it's called the Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation. In 1962, Max took all the property, all the buildings, created a small endowment, and thus the Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. Uh, today we are supported by approximately 450 members. These members pay annual contributions uh, and they're basically what supports our, our operating expenses. Now, within the foundation, we have different programs that the, that the members can, can participate in. Um, and I'll, get, I'll get into those in just a few minutes. But, but uh, the, the foundation, as we know today, is very unique. We're into many, many different activities. Um, our, our, our main lodge, which I'll show you in a few minutes, is our headquarters. Our main office is located there. Um, the central unit is, is, the, is the wooded unit. Uh, has uh, all of the original lakes that Max uh, created. On the east side of the property, the flat egg ground, um, back in the early 50s, Max applied for and was granted the second licensed hunting preserve in the state of Illinois. And that license we still hold today. Some pictures of the, of the, of the foundation today. These, all these lakes at the bottom and down here you see that were created by Max. He must have had a, a, a really magnificent vision for this property. I mean, it just amazes me what the property looks, at, looks like today. If, uh, this is Route 25 up at the top and Duncan Avenue down at the bottom. Um, you can see one of our lakes when you go down uh, just north of the Tollway Bridge, one of our lakes is right along the property. Our uh, offices are over on the, on the right-hand side in our, our pond cottage. This complex is the Milk Pell Restaurant, which back in the 30s and 40s was owned by Max McGraw. In fact, he, uh, 
uh, there was a, a large barn there where he had his stables. Uh, he, he had his uh, paper out on horseback, but all through his life he enjoyed horseback riding. So horseback riding was, was part of his life uh, out here away from the city. This is looking east. Down at the bottom is Route 25. These are uh, gravel pit lakes. And to the left or north is the flat agriculture ground. Uh, back in uh, 1972 through 84, the foundation entered into a, uh, a gravel mining operation. And the sole purpose of this was to raise more operating income. So there was a contract structured with the gravel company where the foundation received a royalty for every ton of gravel that left the property. And then when the, when, as the mining uh, was depleted in a certain area, uh, the gravel company had to come in and reclaim the property to, uh, to our specifications. So th this is, I think this picture is probably back from the early 90s, but uh, it, it turned out these lakes are, are crystal clear. This is groundwater. Uh, we have a very, very uh, high quality uh, fisheries here in these lakes. The, uh, the vegetation has grown up. It's uh, just a high quality home for bird life. Uh, and the, the project, as I said, completed, con concluded in uh, 84. This is another area looking to the north. Uh, the Fox River is up here. Duncan Avenue is here. East Dundee is off to the right. Um, a lot of the property purchase, as I said, was involved in, it was pasture land. There were certain areas such as this. I call this the, the bluffs. This is a, a elevated uh, and overlooks the Fox River. So this area had a lot of native oak hickory uh, forest land on it. And uh, even today, we, we, we manage the, uh, the wood lots to try to keep a new, uh, oak and hickory trees regenerating. Uh, you can see the open spots. These lakes over here, these small, there's, there's 10 small lakes up there. Uh, Max had those created back in the 50s for some of the uh, nationally known conservation organizations, a place where they could come out. They wanted to do some fisheries exper experimenting. So those were built, he built those strictly for uh, outsiders to come in and, and, and do their thing in the research and, and conservation world. Bond Cottage, this is, uh, as I said before, our, our, our main building. Uh, Max started uh, building this in the 1930s. It has been uh, expanded and added on, I think probably four or five times. Today it's about uh, 17,000 square feet or so. Uh, our main office is located here. And this is kind of the, the heartbeat of the foundation. This is the back. It's a two-story building. We did a big renovation in 2010, added an outdoor patio and uh, some new landscaping. The building contains three dining rooms. Um, now all these amenities, if you will, are used by our membership but we also entertain a lot of conservation organizations who come out and use our facilities for meetings or uh, field trips, uh, that type of thing, most of which are at no cost. We have a, uh, this is our largest meeting room. It's a multi-purpose room. We can uh, serve meals here or set it up for uh, lectures and, and meetings. One of our smaller meeting rooms. And we also have overnight rooms. One of our programs, uh, that very popular programs, is our conservation education. Um, these programs are open to the public. And every year, we entertain 12 to 15,000 school-age kids for different programs, as Karen referred to earlier. Um, years ago, uh, when we had our game farm and we were producing game birds, 
that was the big tour. We, we bring the kids over in the spring. They could see all the little chicks. They could see the incubators, see how uh, uh, the hatching, hatching goes. Uh, we, we no longer have the game farm, but we still have uh, many different uh, programs for the kids. District 300, uh, U46. We have a lot of, a lot of scout programs. Our, our uh, conservation education uh, educators are trained and certified so they can host Boy Scout programs and actually the scouts can earn their patches and badges or you know, whatever goes along with it. This is a very popular program in the spring and summer. Uh, it's a, basically just a pond study. We take the kids out to one of the lakes and they take nets and they scoop up uh, a little bit of mud from the bottom of the pond and then they, they put it in the white containers and then they, they identify what's there. All the little critters, the little fish, whatever they pull up in the net, they identify and you know the educators tell them how the, the season changes and what all these little critters are all about in, in, the, uh, in the ponds. Here's a group, we have uh, several different trails around our education building. Here's a group that's just uh, wildlife watching and, uh, and bird watching. One of our real popular programs is the first time fishing, where we bring youngsters out and uh, we actually teach them how to cast, how to put a worm on the hook, how to put a bobber on the line. And uh, we've got a special pond that uh, we keep well stocked because most young kids uh, their attention span is not real long. If they don't, if they don't, <laughs> if they don't catch something within a few minutes, they lose interest. So, uh, and just to, just about 100% of the fishing at the foundation is all catch and release. And another popular program, um, which wasn't real popular years ago, it's gaining momentum, is, is archery. We have uh, special bow, bows that uh, are made for young kids. And uh, they're, they're, the kids really enjoy that. Research. Um, years ago, when, when Max was still alive, uh, probably back in the late 40s, early 50s, he developed an intense interest in, in wildlife fisheries research along with his, his conservation. And uh, research has been at our core mission uh, all through uh, the life of the foundation. In fact, back in the 50s, Max had this building set aside uh, for visiting researchers. To, and if you can read this, at Fisheries Research Station, uh, it was created for North American Wildlife Foundation, Illinois Natural History Survey, and the Illinois Department of, Nat uh, Illinois Department of Conservation. So Max was really, really cared about and was concerned about, uh, you know, techniques that might, management techniques that might, uh, benefit wildlife and, and even fisheries. This building was located right up here on 72 where the reserve townhouse complex is. At one time that was Max McGraw's property. But I'm going to, uh, over the years we've done many, many different types and kinds of research on many different topics. Um, but I want, today I just wanted to focus on our largest uh, and most current uh, research project. This is the Urban Coyote Project. And right now it is the largest and longest running urban coyote project in the country. Uh, we're doing this uh, in cooperation with Cook County Animal Control and Ohio State University. <laughs> Here is what uh, some young pups look like in the den. Uh, well, we, th I don't know, not necessarily from McGraw property, but from the study area within the six county Chicagoland area. Uh, the, the, so soon after we began studying the coyotes, uh, we learned that coyotes are a good deterrent for an overpopulation of Canada geese. Here, here you can see he made a, a nighttime raid on a goose nest, and he's carrying that egg away for a, a midnight snack. Very, very smart animals, I'll tell you. The coyotes are so smart. 
here's one that uh, uh, the, the, the entire project basically uh, is about tracking and learning more about the life and times of the urban coyote. So what happens is our, our field assistants will go out and, and snare a coyote. Um, and what they do when, after they catch them is they do a complete medical exam, if you will. They, they draw blood, they take DNA, they take measurements, and this is all recorded. And then they, the last thing they do is they put this collar on, and that, that white box at the, at the, at the bottom uh, of the collar is actually a radio transmitter. And we've got uh, two telemetry trucks that have a long antenna that sticks up through the hood, uh, through the roof of the, and our researchers go around and they can track where these coyotes are. I mean, we've got, I don't know how many different maps showing packs of coyotes from the loop of Chicago all the way out to here. There, there, you know, every pack of coyotes has its own territory and, and we have them all mapped. And um, Just a, a side note, if you will, uh, early on in the project, we uh, had a couple of our field assistants were in one of the western suburbs here, you know, they were, they drive around and they turn the antenna, you know, so they can pick up, find out where the, the signal's coming from. And uh, one night they were in the western suburbs and, and a uh, police car pulled them over, <laughs> uh, wanting to know what was going on. Uh, and they told them, they told the officer and the officer said, uh, the people that called this in were very concerned because they thought that truck was the government spying on them. Oh. So, <laughs> kind of a... <laughs> but anyway, um, like I said before, these coyotes are so smart. They have uh, dens and home territories, uh, downtown, uh, you know, right downtown uh, in the lakefront. We've got night, night uh, video of the coyotes down in the loop wandering around. I mean, people are going back and forth on the sidewalk, and here's a coyote in the background walking around doing his thing, you know. It's just amazing. Uh, it, it's, it's really amazing how they've, ad, uh, how they've adapted. Um, the latest technology that, that our, our researchers uh, tried out was uh, a tiny video camera that fits underneath their chin. And this allows the researchers to see everything the coyote sees when he turns his head. And and, and over the years, uh, one thing we've learned from this, this study is that coyotes have actually learned to look both ways before crossing a street. <laughs> and and, and this, was, this was proven with this, with this video camera. We've got a, a picture of a coyote coming through a ditch, gets up to the side of the road, and you can see him turn his head. I mean, it's, just, it, it's incredible how smart, these, uh, how smart these coyotes are. And I know there's a lot, a great deal of concern about uh, human safety and coyotes, and um, there's there's really not much recorded information about a coyote actually attacking uh, a human being. They will, however, you know, if you got a little poodle in your backyard at night, uh, that's a different story. But uh, coyotes uh, exist fairly well with uh, with the human population. CLFT, this is a, a, a relatively new program that, we, that we've uh, created along with the Wildlife Management Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, what the issue here was uh, in you know, urban areas like we live in, suburban areas, uh, many of the, the uh, college students graduating from school who were going into wildlife management and who would be our, our future wildlife managers, maybe deciding hunting limits, deciding this, deciding that. Many of these folks had never hunted, fished, or really enjoyed the outdoors or had the knowledge of the outdoors. So along with the Wildlife Management Institute and Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation, we created the CLFT uh, program. Uh, here's the goals of the program. The program covers many different aspects. It's not just about hunting and shooting. It covers, uh, you know, like hunting heritage, traditions, uh, safety, uh, wildlife management. It, 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 
it, it's, it's, it covers many, many different topics. And this program has grown and has become so popular um, that we are expanding, you know, literally every year. We're, we're, uh, there's 40 universities that uh, 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 enjoy this program. And uh, we're involved with many of the, the state and federal wildlife departments, such as Fish and Wildlife, uh, Ducks Unlimited, all these types of organizations. All these uh, organizations and universities are, are sending students to this program. We travel around the country. We, we host these programs in different, different states around the country. And our, our, our goal is not to convert these people into fishermen or hunters. Our goal is to give them knowledge about the, the, the long time heritage of hunting uh, and, and fishing and that type of thing. So we're, we're educating, we're not trying to convert anyone. Um, there's a lot of classroom uh, study uh, involved with this as well as, as outdoor activities. They get hands on experience. Fisheries, we have a uh, fisheries department. We have two full-time fisheries biologists on staff whose main mission is to manage our lakes, our fishing program, and our aquaculture projects. I wanna focus for a minute on our walleye program. We've done extensive walleye uh, research. The, uh, the goal here is to be able to hatch and captive rear walleye and release back to the waters. Uh, walleye and smallmouth bass are the two species we're working with and they're very, very difficult to captive rear and, and we're making headway. So uh, in this particular project, we go out in the springtime and we net uh, adult walleyes. And we bring them in and place them in these glass tubes. These are actually, uh, if you will, fish egg incubators. Okay, and then after, uh, after they hatch, we, there's running water that goes through these tubes, and then on the back side there's a spout, the water uh, flows out into a tank, and this is what it looks like uh, after hatching. Um, we have a small fish hatchery. We have, I think we have like 30 tanks. Uh, the fish are kept in these tanks where we uh, rear them to, depending on the, the, the fish, certain sizes, and they're released into the lakes. Um, another interesting part of uh, our fisheries programs is several years ago, many of the, the state high schools in Illinois actually have a fishing program in their curriculum. And the kids, uh, uh, every spring they have, a, they have a tournament. Well, anyway, we allow, uh, you know, the local schools who have these fishing programs to come out and the kids can uh, go fishing on, on our lakes and just uh, thought I'd show you some of the the nice fish that do exist out at McGraw. Um, in addition, uh, over the years, our, our uh, like, like our wildlife research, we've been involved in many, many different uh, research projects. Um, one of the interesting ones we did, uh, this is going back a few years, but if you remember when the casino gambling boat was put on the Fox River here in Dundee, uh, our uh, fisheries research staff did all the background information. The, uh, it, was a, it was a apparently a state law that there had to be a certain amount of information gathering and, and uh, research done before the, bo the boat could actually be located in a public navigable waterway. And we did all the information gathering for that. Uh, we've been involved in many, many different studies uh, on and off, on and off the uh, property. This is uh, our newest uh, project we're dabbling in. I don't know if many of you have heard of aquaponics. Okay, we're, we're, this is uh, one of our rearing tanks. This white plastic is, is uh, attached to styrofoam and it's actually floating on the water in the tank. And we have young fish we're raising underneath in the water. The nutrients from the fish grow the lettuce and herbs and, and that type of thing. It, it's really remarkable. There's, there's uh, some really large aquaponics uh, operations going on in Chicago. 
Uh, I visited one up in Milwaukee where they're just, uh, just huge, big, long tanks of, of fish with all this nice greenery growing on top of the tanks. It's a remarkable process and, it, you know, fairly cost effective also. You're growing uh, food and also raising fish, so it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Land management uh, is very much part of the foundation. Um, we have a lot of nat uh, re replanted native prairie areas. Every couple of years, the prairie areas are burned. Uh, this helps uh, uh, helps the, the, the wild native grasses and forbs regenerate, adds nutrients to the, to the ground. We also do a lot of work with our woodlands. Here we're burning our woodlands. We have uh, 155 acres of our woodlands enrolled in the state of Illinois Woodland Management Program. Uh, the, the objective here is you, to remove all the invasive exotic material, either by machine or by hand, um, and then you burn off the woodlands for a few years. You take some of the undesirable trees and you, and you, you remove them, opening up the canopy to allow sunlight to come down. And within a few years, you'll, you will uh, see the natural regeneration, you know, from the, the acorns that fall. Um, I, did, I did an area not, uh, well, maybe two years ago, where we opened up the canopy and you could go up there and you could see in the woods, it was fairly dark under the canopy and, and here's this big circle of, of light. And uh, within no time, this is where all the young oak trees were starting to, 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 to pop up. So it's, uh, it's a very rewarding. And there, there, there's so much exotic and invasive plant material nowadays. I don't know how much you know about uh, land management, but uh, you know, bitter, uh, uh, Asian bittersweet, uh, buckthorn and all this is just taking over all the native wildflowers and, and young trees. This is a fen that we're, we're renovating. This is, uh, uh, as I call it, on the bluff overlooking the Fox River. Uh, it's a, a, a gramoid fen. Uh, gramoid fen has peat underneath and uh, the water uh, bubbles up to the surface through the limestone. Uh, it's a remarkable piece of property. Max really did his, his homework when he bought this property. Uh, all along the hillsides there are hillside seeps, uh, fens, and springs. It's, uh, he, he knew what he was doing. Uh, as I said before, uh, we do have a, a controlled hunting preserve on the property. We have our own kennel. Uh, we have about 25, 30 dogs. Uh, we also have kennel runs available to our members to, to board their dogs. Uh, here, uh, our dog trainers out exercising the dogs. You can see the little white uh, bump, bumper, we call it. We throw it in the water and the dog retrieves it. Play target shooting, um, which I'm sure many of you uh, might hear on a Saturday morning throughout the, the valley. Uh, very, 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 very popular sport. Um, these are, these are uh, actually clay targets. We use biodegradable clay targets that, you know, once they're broke or fall on the ground and break, they'll uh, biodegrade. And we have uh, five different shooting venues. There's, there's different, there's like sporting clays, five stand, different types of shooting venues. And they're all about uh, creating different presentations or uh, hunting scenarios, if you will, with these clay targets. Uh, all Shooting sports at the McGraw Wildlife Foundation requires a trained McGraw guide to accompany uh, all the shooters. Farming. Believe it or not, in the middle of suburbia, we're still farming. Uh, back when, uh, in, the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, we farmed probably about 400 acres. Today, we farm 125 acres of corn soybeans, and we also plant over 100 acres of uh, annual wildlife habitat food plots. Hunter safety, I don't know if you're familiar with the hunter safety program. This is a, a state sanctioned program. It's a law in Illinois, anyone born after 1980 
has to take the hunter safety program in order to obtain a hunting license. So we, uh, we, uh, we host the, the hunter safety program. It's uh, very popular. We get calls from people all around northern Illinois. Uh, here, here we are, you know, discussing uh, uh, shotguns and different kinds of, of uh, uh, rifles and handguns. But the program is, is more than just about guns and hunting. Uh, it, it, it's much like our CLFT program. It gets into um, safety. It gets into uh, information about game species. It gets into quite a bit about hunting ethics and, and the responsibility you have when you are a hunter. Uh, and, and again, it's just we, we host, I think, one a month and maybe a couple, a couple months. We have two a month. And as soon as they hit the DNR, uh, Department of Conservation website, well, I tell you, they book up really fast. Here's one of our guides explaining the safety to the kids. And we also um, uh, have the opportunity to allow them to actually take a couple shots. Uh, you can sit in a classroom and learn about all this stuff, but it's nice to actually go out in the field and, and shoot a shotgun and know what it's like. So we have that uh, luxury to be able to do that. This is a voluntary program. Uh, Many of the state instructors, I was an instructor for many years, uh, and this is all done uh, at the time of the instructor. Uh, so right now, unfortunately, there's not that many instructors, and, and I think that's why we, we're getting overwhelmed. I wanted to throw this in. This was this probably one of our uh, more popular photograph uh, sites. This, this is... Uh, Part of the trout stream, actually, that I showed you. And since I enjoy the sport of birding, I thought I would conclude with a few pictures of uh, some of the bird life at McGraw. There's a, uh, a great heron, uh, egret, I'm sorry. Sandhill crane out in one of our fields. A pair of bluebirds. Goldfinches uh, eating coneflower seeds. This is a uh, hooded merganser with a, uh, a brood of probably a week old ducklings. A green heron. Oh, you don't see them. They're, they're fairly common around here, but they're always skulking uh, underneath the vegetation along the, the, the ponds and the river, what have you. This is what I call Molary and Curly. Uh, <laughs> These are, uh, these are young great horned owls that haven't left the nest yet. And then with that, I will say thank you for coming to listen.